Hi there and welcome to Worship with Followers. Always glad to see you. Have you ever seen a really sloppy job that is set in stone? Perhaps tiling work where one row is slightly off kilter or a doorway that doesn't fit the door properly or a place where the pattern on a t-shirt has been sprayed slightly off center. For some people, good enough is good enough. And for others, the sight of that poor workmanship drives us crazy, especially when it's permanently set for all to see for all time. I think a big part of that is because most of us are smart enough to know this truth. If you can see a problem, a weakness, or a flaw, then there are probably several more issues you can't see. And that leads to the good enough crowd lacking a critical component of a characteristic that God calls us to embrace. Rick says, each of us is a work in progress, but that won't go well if we don't build integrity into our lives. The Bible has lots to say about what integrity is, how we develop it, and what happens if we don't. When it comes to building character and the church, integrity makes the difference between completeness and utter collapse. So grab your tools. One of the reasons we come together as a church, whether it's in person or online, is to be reaffirmed about our very identity. The world tries to rob us of that at every chance through the week, but we come together to worship the God who set us free and called us his very own. But he brought me in all oh, his love for me, all oh, his love for me. Who the song sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes I
I just love hearing our reading today from 1 Corinthians from the Message Scripture, a modern paraphrase that can give us great insights. Listen as Paul lays out the building plans that we need to use. You are God's building. I, Paul, designed blueprints using the gift God gave me as a good architect. Another is putting up the walls. Let each carpenter who arrives on the job take care to build on the foundation. Remember, there is only one foundation, the one already laid, Jesus Christ. Take special care in picking out your building materials. Eventually, there's going to be an inspection. If you use cheap or inferior materials, you'll be found out. The inspection will be thorough and rigorous, and you won't get away with a thing. If your work passes inspection, fine. If it doesn't, your part of the building will be torn out and started over. You realize, don't you, that you are the temple of God, and God himself is present in you. This song says, may your light shine in the darkness as we walk before the cross. We are called to come before the glorious God, absorb his radiance and reflect that to the world around us. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful. Where your streams of abundance flow Blessed be your name Blessed be your name When I'm found in the desert place Though I walk through the wilderness Blessed be your name and every blessing Blessed be your name On the road marked with suffering Blessed be your name On the road marked with suffering Though there's pain in the offering Blessed be your name
One of the definitions of integrity is who you are when no one's looking. And we all know people who do things when they think they can get away with it that they would never do in front of others if they thought someone was looking. We always need to examine ourselves, but sometimes I think we put far too much emphasis on looking at us. If we focus our attention on God, His greatness and His glory, if we absorb the character of God and expose ourselves to it as much as possible, we will become people of integrity more and more. Oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the world thy hands have made I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder Thy power throughout The universe displayed Then sings my soul My Savior God to me How great thou art how great thou art Then sings my soul My saving God to thee How great thou art God, his son, not sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can take it. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? 
then I shall bow In humble adoration I'm there proclaiming My God, how great thou art What do you think about when you hear the term Wall Street? A lot of people know that Wall Street is an area in New York City. It's actually about eight blocks long, and it's the famous financial district filled with the headquarters of many world banks and the New York Stock Exchange. The term means money business in our culture, and it includes the players in the money game, many of whom are not known for their high moral standards. In 1987, William Morrow and Company published a book called The Complete Book of Wall Street Ethics. When you open it, all the pages are blank. It's a good joke. But what would your book like if you recorded everything that you have done to earn your salvation? Well, it too would be blank. We need to constantly remind ourselves that there's nothing we can ever do that's going to buy or earn our way into heaven. It's not our adhering to the rules or doing good charity work that gets us a spot in the good place. The only way to get there is perfection. And that's not me. And I'm guessing it's not you either. Romans 3.10 reminds us, no one is righteous, not even one. So each Sunday we stop in gratitude to thank the one whose book is filled to overflowing with his generous actions and unselfish love for us. Jesus paid the price for our eternal life, and we remember, we honor, and we thank him.
Well, we've seen some of the evil people in this world prosper in wealth and a lot of stuff. We always need reminding of that old saying, God's payday isn't necessarily Friday. God has a reward for those of us who are faithful and patient, and His promise is that as we grow in integrity, so do His blessings. To the faithful, you show yourself faithful, and to those with integrity, you show integrity. That's from 2 Samuel. Hold on to your integrity this week, and let's all try to elevate it with things that God teaches us about integrity. And for more on that, here's Rick with Church Building. June 2021, a 12-story condominium in Surfside, Florida partially collapsed, killing almost 100 people. October 2019, a bridge in northeast Taiwan suddenly gave way, falling onto fishing boats and a tanker below. Six people died and 20 were injured. And April 2013, when an eight-story commercial building pancaked in the capital of Bangladesh, it crushed to death more than 1,100 people and seriously hurt 2,500 more. Aside from terrorism, it was the most deadly collapse in modern history. Though most of us don't know much about engineering, we're all familiar with what happens when structural integrity is compromised. So today I'm going to talk about building. Not building buildings and other structures, but building Christian character with an emphasis on integrity. I'll use some jaw-dropping illustrations from engineering and construction because they perfectly suit the biblical concept. But first, what exactly is integrity? In the Old Testament, the word refers to being sound, complete, and perfect. The whole idea is the absence of a weak spot that can cause problems. So when the Jews offered sacrifices, they had to use perfectly healthy, unblemished animals. Likewise, God expected His people to be morally sound and unspotted. He tells Solomon, If you follow me with integrity and obey all my commands, I will establish your throne over Israel forever. In the New Testament, integrity is linked to honesty, purity, and doing good. Jesus was talking about integrity when he said, Blessed are those with pure hearts, for they will see God. Our hearts are to be without any weak spots that can cause the collapse of our lives or our spirituality. And that's where structural integrity comes in. It's an engineering term, but just listen to how it applies to life and faith. Structural integrity helps ensure something is fit for its purpose, is safe even beyond normal conditions, that it can support its own weight and won't deform, break, or suffer catastrophic failure during its lifetime. Moral and spiritual integrity is designed to do the same. God wants us to serve our purpose, be safe, carry our own load, and avoid costly failure. To learn how to do that, it's valuable to look at what causes collapse in the first place, physical and moral. The first factor is lack of knowledge. A case in point is Tacoma Narrows Bridge in Washington State, which collapsed in 1940, long before it fell apart. The structure was famous for its dramatic swaying, which gave it the nickname Galloping Gertie. The problem was the bridge had solid walls that didn't let enough wind pass through. So the wind got trapped in the structure, making it rock from side to side and undermining its stability with violent vibrations. Then, during an especially fierce windstorm, the structure fell apart and plunged into the Puget Sound. When it was constructed, 
Builders simply didn't know enough about how wind affected high bridges. But after the accident, bridges all over the world were altered to prevent similar collapses. Our spiritual integrity will be a lot stronger too if we know the dangers and how to avoid them. That's why it's important to understand the Word and what it has to say about life and faith. And just as important, when we do make mistakes, we need to learn from them to improve our own lives and help those around us not mess up in the same way. Our original design is perfect because God is perfect. But sometimes when we build our lives, we don't follow His blueprint as we should, just as construction errors creep into many projects. In life, it's a recipe for disaster whenever we cut corners, ignore standards set by God, or do shoddy work when He calls us to do something. And a lot of the time, the problems begin when we use the wrong foundation. at a multi-billion dollar construction site in China. <laughs> An entire wall buckled and dragged everything into a pit because of soft soil on the site. And remember that Bangladeshi disaster? Investigators found the building was built on a filled-in pond that compromised its structural integrity. It started to sink, and even though cracks in the walls prompted some businesses to close the night before the collapse, garment workers were ordered inside next morning. I never knew him. It reminds me of Jesus and the parable about the wise and foolish builders. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Knowledge and obedience are the foundation, but that's just the beginning. We also have to build our lives with the right material that conforms to standards. In the Bangladeshi case, cheap inferior concrete was used, which weakened the building, especially when it was overloaded with heavy machinery and generators that caused serious vibrations. And along with defective materials, there was a problem with modification. The building was converted from commercial use to industrial without new safeguards built in. And three more floors were added to the original structure, which could no longer hold the weight. Simply put, the building wasn't used for the purpose it was designed for, so it collapsed. And the same thing happens to us when we ignore the standards in God's codebook, build our lives with inferior things that can never make us happy or stable, or when we live for a purpose we were never made for. If everything is about money, popularity, and success, we may be okay for a while, but it's only a matter of time before everything falls in. Going back to our Florida example, investigators traced the condo collapse to structural deterioration. Long-term water seepage in the underground parking garage had weakened concrete and corroded the reinforcing steel. It was a disaster years in the making. And that's the way with sin too. It doesn't always weaken us right away, and its effects usually take time to show up. So we often think we've got it under control or that we've gotten away with it until seemingly out of nowhere, everything falls apart, devastating us and those around us.
an incredible amount of tragedy is caused by slow and insidious rot, corrosion, and fatigue. In fact, the construction industry has a name for that. It's called creep. The slow, almost imperceptible deterioration of materials when they're undermined by water, weight, or general weakness. The spiritual equivalent to that is moral compromise and accommodation. When we give in, one little lie, one tiny deceit and deception at a time. So we need to address sin right away, instead of ignoring it at our peril. Listen how James describes the fatal progression of sin. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to separation from God. So get rid of all the filth in your lives and humbly accept the word God has put in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. Just be sure your faith is in God alone. Don't waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave blown by the wind. Such people are torn between God and the world, and they're unstable in all they do. Even steel may seem incredibly strong, but if it gets too hot, it begins to weaken. Get it hot enough and it loses more than half its strength. That's when it buckles and begins to twist, so engineers always build in environmental factors when designing a project. Our designer does the same. He knows we have to build our lives in a spiritual environment that ranges from the extremes of icy cold apathy and indifference to the plight of others, to the white hot anger and egotism that comes from greed, envy, and ambition. So the Apostle Paul tells his protege Titus not to live like everybody else. We should live with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God totally committed to doing good, while we look forward to the day when Jesus will be revealed. And it's no accident that he says right before that, you yourself must be an example by doing good of every kind. Let everything you do reflect the integrity and seriousness of your teaching. Another factor involving structural integrity is the inevitability of damage. It's not enough to make sure a structure can withstand day-to-day -day wear and tear. It also has to be able to handle extreme conditions that can lead to catastrophic failure. Things like earthquakes and tornadoes. And it's the extraordinary events in our lives that bring out our real strength. Things like pain, loss, and hardship. Anybody can be strong when things are going well, but it takes faith and integrity to withstand the truly awful things life throws at us. And if we do stick close to God and show that integrity, people are going to notice. Peter says, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it, but in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they'll be ashamed when they see what a good life you lead, because you belong to Christ. So to recap, spiritual integrity is undermined by lack of knowledge, ignoring standards, 
building on a faulty foundation, making unauthorized changes to the designer's original plan, trying to build stability with things that are defective, failing to see the danger in slow but inevitable threats, and not being prepared for a crisis. So what can we do on a practical level to enhance our spiritual integrity? Well, again, we can take some lessons from construction experts. They say the keys to strength and stability are inspection, maintenance, and repair. That begins with checking to see that a structure has been built according to the designer's plans and standards. Spiritually, we do that when we measure our lives against what the Bible says about the attitudes and behavior of Jesus. He's not just the master, he's the master plan. So if we stick to his example, we'll be sound, complete, and perfectly suited for the purpose we were created to fulfill, which is to glorify God by loving him and each other. And that will happen even when we're in the middle of the storms of life. So start with a spiritual inspection. Examine yourself, says Paul, to see if you really are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize that Jesus is in you, unless you fail to meet that test? But keep in mind, integrity is not just a case of good design. It needs to be maintained on a regular basis. So when we see sin and weakness in ourselves, we have to address them to stay safe and strong. That's why James tells us it's not enough to know what the code book says. We have to follow it. He says, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. For if you don't obey, it's like seeing your face in a mirror, then forgetting what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free and do what it says, God will bless you. But also remember, he gives us each other to help with that process. We're not always able to see the small and subtle things that grow into big problems. But if we have honest, trusting relationships with each other, we'll speak the truth in love, as Paul says in Ephesians 4, and help each other tap into the strength of God. It's no wonder the New Testament compares the church to a building or a temple. In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says the foundation, the thing on which the church is built, is Jesus. Then he says we have to be careful how we build on that foundation, because one day God will judge our work and our lives and reveal what we've done. And he concludes by saying, don't you realize all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple, for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Stop deceiving yourselves. If you think you're wise by this world's standards, you need to become a fool to become truly wise, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. In other words, God has fit us together perfectly using power and standards the world knows nothing about. Our role is simple. We need to be that temple, a visible symbol of God's presence on this earth. And we do that by living like Jesus. Dishonesty destroys the treacherous, says Proverbs 11.3 but integrity guides good people. May it be so with us, because despite the odds, God can use integrity to make this church and every church into something truly amazing and unexpected. So Christians can always say, excitement is building.